Welcome, everyone, to the C-Suite Sales and Marketing Perspectives podcast. I'm Steve McDonald, your host, and today we have a fantastic guest on with Cara Brown. Cara has her own company and agency, a B2B go-to-market agency. You are hyper-focused on a $2 trillion market, <laughs> the supply chain market. What we're going to talk about is how do we create a successful B2B go-to-market motion? What does that execution look like? What do we find that on a regular basis are the things that, that derail us, that we don't get right from the beginning, and then all of a sudden, we're halfway down, we we're, we're, think we're nearing the end, but we haven't covered the things that are going to be, they're going to make us successful. And so there's foundational things, but there's a lot more that we're going to be talking about today as well. Maybe give us a little bit more introduction to you and your agency lead coverage, and we'll take it from there. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me, Steve. I'm super excited to be here. So like you said, I'm Kara Brown and I run Lead Coverage. We are the largest go-to-market consultancy that hyper-focuses on supply chain. You mentioned it's a $2 trillion industry and it is. People often ask me, hey, when are you going to expand beyond supply chain? And I was like, I don't think I need to. I have a $2 trillion market that has barely scratched the surface of all things go-to-market historically, the sort of supply chain market is behind the rest of B2B, MarTech and FinTech and EdTech. So we have a lot of catching up to do in our space, which is really fun. And lead coverage gets to sit at this really interesting connection of all of the cool stuff happening in B2B MarTech and the exciting things that are happening in other spaces and bringing that to the supply chain ecosystem, which traditionally is a little laggard. And it's a massive industry, right? We touch anything that touches a truck, a plane, or a boat. We think of supply chain as the physical movement of goods, the tech that moves those goods, and the money that moves those goods. And everything that you touch, put on your body, eat, play with your children, in your car, what you drive, like everything in your life has been on a truck. We're really integral to that overall macroeconomics in America and beyond. We're global. We service clients all over the globe. The global macroeconomic logistics and supply chain market is closer to $8 trillion. It just sounds like such a silly number, like $8 trillion TAM. Like it just sounds goofy. So we stick to the $2 trillion here in the U.S. and we're super happy to serve that hyper-specific niche. It's really fun. We're having a great time. And there's so much synergy between our clients, right? When you have a client that does robots for warehouses and a client who does final mile technology and a client that does CapEx capitalization and consulting for big retail chains and cross-docking and warehouse consolidation. There's just so many pieces to this industry that people don't even, they're not even aware of most of the time. And really having this specialization in all this where we can talk the talk with our clients has been a game changer for us in terms of growth and really being more strategic than just sending emails and writing copy. And that's one of the things that when you and I talked, I really liked because obviously the audience here is far beyond supply chain, but we are all B2B, right? And we all deal with an ABM sales process. We're trying to influence buyers over seven months, 12 months, 15 months or more. And so a lot of what we're talking about today, in fact, all of it applies definitely to the supply chain, but it supplies or applies directly to all of us and what we're trying to do. So with that, what I wanted to do is I wanted to get your opinion on in that world, what is the biggest challenge that is going on today that you're helping to solve for your clients? So we have a very specific approach to the work we do, B2B demand gen and B2B go-to-market in general. So we wrote a book on this. It's called The Revenue Engine. It'll be out this fall. We're super excited about it. So it's 60,000 words on B2B go-to-market. Our approach is pretty simple. It's share good news, track interest, follow up. Now, it sounds really easy and everyone's okay, Kara. It sounds like a pretty easy framework, but there are really important pieces that sort of layer themselves beneath that three-step process. And I think if your question is, what are some of the challenges that we see when we walk in the door in a consulting environment? The number one issue we see is that most of our clients haven't spent the time to identify their actual ideal customer profile. So there are 19,677 shippers in America with more than 7 million in shipping spend. This is a super nerdy thing to know, but this is what my, my clients care about this number. So that 20,000 company TAM 
is about all we have to go after right now. Carriers and trucking companies, a little bit, but these are shippers. These are the folks that actually own the cargo that's being shipped. And most of my clients, when you walk in the door and you ask them, who is your ideal customer profile? They will tell you anyone who ships, which is not true. Because if you ship missiles for the DOD, that is a very different kind of shipping than shipping shampoo and doing retail consolidation into Wal Walgreens, right? Very different types of shipments. And really understanding that ideal customer profile and separating it from the wish list customer profile is where we spend a lot of our time and energy. This goes back to knowing the niche, understanding the niche, that there really is a difference between shipping bombs and shipping shampoo. If you don't really understand this market, you wouldn't really understand what the challenges might be in both of those and how they're different. We spend a lot of time with our clients talking about what is your ideal customer profile and how do we go out there and understand the demographic and the technographic landscape around this ICP. Even though someone's shipping shampoo, there are technographic characteristics of that shipper. Things like what is the TMS they're using? What's the WMS, so the transportation management software, the warehouse management software, the order management software that we can plug into easier or not as easy, depending on the sophistication of the shipper and the sophistication of either the warehouse provider or the transportation provider. So there's this whole ecosystem of technology that is really impacting what a, a really strong ideal customer profile looks like. I'll tell you a funny story. So we walked into a new client, a new engagement, and they had a marketing team of five. They even had a person on their team whose title was ABM. Like they had a whole ABM title. And so we were thrilled. We we're like, this is going to be great. These guys are going to know what they're doing. They're going to have their proverbial what together. It's going to be awesome. And their total addressable market was about 40,000 companies total. So we knew like globally how many companies could potentially be a customer. And we walked in and we said, show us your HubSpot ecosystem. How many folks are in HubSpot? Show us the number of companies. And they had a total of, wait for it, a total of 2,500 email addresses, total. And so we said, guys, how are you marketing this 40,000 company TAM if you only own 2,500 email addresses? Like you're not even scratching the surface of knowing the individuals that we need to reach out to. So we walk in and we take control and we say, okay, this is exactly who your ideal customer profile is. Here is the list from Zoom Info or Sales Intel. This is how we're going to get in front of these people. And this is what these people are interested in. And that is most of the beginning of our engagement. So within that framework and starting out, the who is more important than the what. And we don't spend enough time on the who. So many companies, we talk about our audience. We're designing products for them. We're designing technologies for them. What marketing message is going to get the most engagement for them? We're talking about them all the time. So we have a tremendous amount of familiarity. And that familiarity turns into confidence that we know what we're doing, right? Instead of understanding exactly who it is, finding out those demographics, those technographics, the infographics, and then the the emotions and the risks that are involved. That's what people don't understand in the world of B2B is that people's careers are on the line. They're making decisions that if they make the wrong decision, there's somebody else that can probably do the job better than you and the finger starts pointing at you. So the fact that there's not an understanding of the challenges that our clients are facing, that our ICP is facing, and really getting to know them, not be familiar with them, has to be the start. It's really funny you mentioned this. So just today, we were having a conversation about a client and there were two very specific companies. So they told us we are, there are 300 companies on our target list. We know exactly who we need to go after. This is the 300 company list. And so we took the list and we were like, wow, we think this is actually like missing a lot of companies, right? So if we plug this into our system and our tools and the way we do it, we get like 1200 companies. And so we gave them this expanded list. And they started going through the list of extra companies and there was a bike company on the list. And so this particular company is looking for small parts distribution. They want their shippers need to have very small parts so that they can ship small parts. And they were like, this is a bike company. We don't want this bike company on the list. And so we reminded them that this bike company, about 80% of their volume is parts and accessories, like 
water bottle holders or hats. Like they have a whole apparel line in this bike company. And so our client was like, oh, we didn't even know that. Like we would have not had them on the list. And so I think you're right. I love the idea of you're familiar, but not intimate. And you have a tendency when you become familiar with something to discount things faster than maybe you really should. Or you think that you're an expert in this very specific vertical. And so you're going to discount companies that you don't know. And it's it's impossible. I don't care who you're talking to. You could be talking to the, like, the chief commercial officer at C.H. Robinson who thinks he knows every single shipper on the planet, right? There is a shipper that guy hasn't met. I am going to bring someone to the table that this guy doesn't know. There, it's impossible for everyone to know every logo. And so I think having the trust in the tools to tell you, this is your ideal customer profile. Here are the companies that match the profile and the characteristics that you've given us in your perfect customer. And letting the tools really tell you these are companies that do match your profile. I think a lot of times, people get involved and their feelings about logos or their personal filters have a tendency to steer them down one path or another. And it's really important to elevate above and really think about it from a, what are the tools telling me perspective. Absolutely. You have to get past familiarity. So you expand more. Before we get back to the three-step process that you talked about earlier, you talk about alignment in the go-to-market strategy. Tell us what you mean about the alignment and why it's so important. Yeah. So really for us, B2B historically, and this is actually the whole Harvard Business Review book on this, as a matter of fact, (laughs) whole book on the competition between sales and marketing and how sales and marketing are always at odds. I grew up on the marketing side of a B2B house, right? I sold obviously, but also spent a lot of time in marketing. Your marketing is always the redheaded stepchild in the room, right? Mm-hmm. Like, thanks so much for the garbage lead, the marketing team, and then the sales team doesn't call them and we'll never know if they were halfway decent leads because we never called them. So I think that's really important. And the way that the marketing team gets alignment with sales is math. And so many times I have interviewed people or spent time with people that are in the B2B marketing silo. When I started, actually the first chapter of the book is all about being the marketing girl and not having a seat at the table because I would show up to meetings with no math. I would show up with pictures and I would show up with this awareness math. Look at all of our Facebook followers and people are like, we don't care. Like it doesn't turn into (laughs) revenue. So for a marketer to be in alignment with the go-to-market engine and the go-to-market team. So marketing sales and either customer success or account management in the in our world, do usually call it account managers, is to be really clear on understanding the unit economics. This always starts with value. What is the average value of a deal? And most of the time there's an enterprise deal and some sort of transactional deal. So there's an enterprise, there's an RFP, or there's a something that's happening in an enterprise perspective. And then there's another version of whatever you're selling that's a little below the enterprise opportunity, but there's a a toe in the water. And if you as a marketer don't understand the ARR, the annual run rate, or the LTV, the lifetime value of what you're selling, you will never be in the room. And so really understanding the value of each deal that's in the pipeline is super important for marketers. And most of them, just this is super generality, right? That I talk to don't know, right? They're talking about websites and pretty pictures and content. And you're like, that none of that matters if you're not driving revenue. The second piece to really being in alignment with the sales and marketing team is velocity. How fast are we moving these deals through the pipeline? And you can only get velocity if you have a really strong CRM. Now, a strong CRM is just HubSpot. This is not, you don't just spend a million dollars on it, but understanding how fast deals move through the pipeline. And it's the only place that you can hold sales accountable. Our SOP for our SDRs, when they make a dial, we don't do cold calls, we do these warm calls, but when they do talk to, try to get in front of a human, is 35 touches before we disqualify. And most of the time inside of our clients, these salespeople are not touching their prospects more than two or three times before they give up. And so velocity has a lot to do with follow-up. And then volume, right? Doing the backwards math on, okay, this is the value of the average deal. This is how fast they're going through the pipeline. So how many do we need in order to hit our goals? And I think... For the go-to-market team to be aligned from the start, 
you have to start with math and goals that are not goals like how many campaigns we're going to run or how many landing pages we're going to create or how many press releases we're going to send. It has to be about revenue generating math. And if you start with volume, velocity, and value inside the marketing ecosystem that you can control, then you'll have a lot more alignment than if you're just talking about landing pages and campaigns. I talked to a CEO the other day that was looking to hire a new CMO. And he said, I'm tired of them coming in. And when we talk about brand, they talk about colors and they talk about the logo, right? So every CMO today should know that they need to be very pipeline focused and very revenue focused. And then attribution focused as well. The problem is making that connection isn't always as easy as it seems. So a lot of companies will, like it's the MQL, right? But how many times have we read about or articles on the death of the MQL, right? It's not about just an MQL that marketing throws over the wall at sales. And now it's up to you, right? Sales is a part of, a, we all talk about a buyer's journey, but then somehow we divvy up our like our fiefdoms and we're in this part of the, we're at the top of the funnel and then we throw it over to you and then you take it, right? And then afterwards, maybe there's somebody called customer success that takes over the, we've separated our fiefdoms. We all have different plans. We all have different goals of how we th we're making that handoff, right? And when you and I spoke together before, you talked about working together, marketing, sales, and customer service. Tell me a bit more about how that game plan, that go-to-market single plan comes together in your mind. Yeah. So for us, it follows the share good news, track interest, follow-up approach, right? And we actually had a call earlier today talking about how if we manage this in a vacuum, right, in one system in a vacuum, then we can measure attribution. We can tell you how many, for us, it's great, right? Because we can tell you, hey, you paid us a million bucks and we delivered 240 million top line. Like, we paid for ourselves or we delivered 26 million bottom line. We paid for ourselves. Like you should continue to pay us. And in B2B, those numbers are insane, right? We have a client whose average deal size is a half a billion dollars. So one deal and I pay for myself 10 times over. Your question was, how do we get them on the same page? And the real answer is working backwards from math. And then we like to measure things in a vacuum. But it must have been like 2016 or so. We were doing a really good job for this client. We were delivering tons and tons of leads and their sales team just would not call them. And he fired us and he said, I'm firing you because your leads are garbage. And I was like, here are the 88 leads we sent you. They are exactly in your ideal customer profile. And here is the activity record showing that no one from your team ever called them. I wasn't going to save the business, nor should I have, like it wasn't a good fit, but it really sent a light bulb up for me that I was going to continue to hit this wall if I didn't just create my own darn SDR team. So I did. So we have our own team of SDRs. We do not make cold calls. Cold calls can convert at about a 1% conversion ratio. That's HubSpot math, not my math. And so we are making dials against the records that come in from the efforts that we're executing. So we execute commercial PR. So this is not your standard PR. I don't know. We're having a holiday picnic. Like nobody cares. We're talking about actual commercial PR. So things that are happening, indexes, points of view on macroeconomic changes, and then shepherding that through the pipeline down through a HubSpot or a Salesforce or a Marketo ecosystem into the hands of people who actually care, who are the ideal customer profile. We are then making the first dial, Right. And once we make that first dial and we say this is a human that ships, they have X number of shipments, et cetera, we are then passing it off to the sales team. There are two ways it goes when we pass it off to the sales team, Steve. Either one, they're thrilled and they can't wait to call them and they follow up with them and they turn into leads, which happens all the time, or they are not following up or they're making one or two calls because the leadership of the client has either diminished the value of what's coming from marketing or two, required them to do their own prospecting. And so this comes, this is the B activity, right? So it has to be the activity that's the A activity, or we'll just take it back ourselves and we'll keep calling ourselves until it's like really highly qualified. And so I think it's really important to stay aligned on the whole team, right? And so sometimes we have a tendency, marketing marketers have a tendency to operate in a vacuum. And we'll do things that the sales team is unaware of, or we'll send campaigns that the sales team doesn't really know what's going on. And so if, 
if that's broken, then when you dump these onto the sales team's plate, they don't really know what this person has seen. They don't know what they're interested in, right? And what's been really cool is the application of the intent data on top of what we're able to see anyway. So being able to hand a rep a fully loaded dossier is what we call it on here is Apple. We know they're looking to insource their supply chain. These are the intent signals their team is sending out. We've talked to these two humans. They're clearly in a buying cycle. And then we just had the conversation today with another client on you still have to get in front of the right person. We can tell you that this company is in a buying signal, but it doesn't always work that you're in, like, you're physically dialing just the right person at just the right time. And so there is a bit of a Disconnect is the wrong word, but you do have to work through the workflow of who is responsible for finding the right human to talk to about this particular problem. And in B2B, that can be up to seven to 10 people, right? Gartner says yeah. that the buying committee is doing almost 50% of their research before they ever reach out to someone or want to be reached out to. 95% of your buying market is not in market. So you're looking for the 5% that have a committee of 10 people that are currently in a buying cycle that know they want to buy from you. It's a needle in a haystack. You're really looking for just the right person at just the right time. And they exist, right? We find them, but it's not as easy as it used to be. You can't just pick up the phone and dial someone's phone number and assume that they're going to answer anymore. The key, I think the major challenge in all B2B marketing today is exactly what you hit on. And Gartner has the stats on the self-service B2B buying trend. Yeah. Right. They put it at 82% or so far down the buyer's journey. They've made their short list. They know what they're looking for. As organizations that are selling into these buyers, our job is how do we get earlier in that buyer's journey? Right? Because if we wait to the end, they don't want to talk to us at the end and we're not on that list. Then as humans, they're not trying to open up the list again. They're not trying to rethink decisions that they've already made, which is already sailed. Can I give you a story that I tell my supply chain prospects about intent data? Absolutely. So the way that I explain intent data or ABM, I use it, what I say is we're going to talk about ABM. I want you to think of the word ABM, like the word healthcare, right? Like it's a big word. Like the word account-based marketing is like the word healthcare. It doesn't actually mean anything. It just means a lot of different things, right? So different people, Tim Cook gets on stage and tells the marketplace that he is insourcing his supply chain when this happens. So right now, Apple is one of the largest procurers of outsourced supply chain in the world, right? Everything goes on someone else's truck. Everything is on someone else's boat. Everything's in someone else's warehouse. Like their entire supply chain is outsourced. They don't own any of it themselves. Amazon is the opposite. So one day, Tim Cook will tell the market, we're insourcing our supply chain. It will be one sentence on one earnings call that no one will really pay attention to except for the billions of dollars of vendors that are currently serving Apple's supply chain. When Tim Cook says this on stage, that decision was not made that morning. That decision was made a year before by a Tiger team in Cupertino who are right now looking for warehouse management, transportation management. How do I buy a fleet? Where should my fleets be? Where do I put my warehouse? Like they're researching all of these things to insource their supply chain, right? The reason you mentioned this earlier, like what is the pain, right? The reason that they're insourcing their supply chain is because during the pandemic, their transportation line on their P&L was like quadruple, if not 6x what it should be, right? They got held over a barrel by a bunch of their vendors and they don't want that to happen again. So they're going to insource this. But the key is that those that Tiger team in Cupertino are right now putting out these breadcrumbs. They are not going to look again. No. So if you wait until Tim Cook gets on stage to tell yeah. everyone that he's doing this, that ship has sailed, right? Absolutely. Like you're Absolutely. done. Those vendors were chosen. And so what I tell the clients that I'm talking to that every day now is you're looking for the breadcrumbs. No one is going to tell you, hey, Apple's going to insource their supply chain in 18 months. You have to figure that out for yourself. But there are tools now who can give you the breadcrumbs to put together to make this obvious. And so I think Gardner's right. That is a tiger team of probably 20 people in Cupertino. They are all doing their own research. And by the time they get to the bottom of how we're going to make this decision, the Apple team's already made a call. They're not reaching out to vendors after Tim Cook gets on stage and mentions it. 
that's done. That's been finished two years before. Yeah. So that's the big challenge, right? If we don't understand that as not just marketers, not just sellers, but as organizations that are trying to scale and grow, that we have to be much more cunning than we ever had to be today. That 95% of the market is not in the market to buy when they do come into market, right? That's the breadcrumb trails that you're talking about. That's why Zoom Info and, and LinkedIn just came out with their intent data and everything like that. Intent data is golden because then you know who and when, but you still have to have a message that's relevant. You can't just come in with speeds and feeds in product. You have to come in with an understanding of how you're helping them Agreed. solve their total problems. I totally That's, agree. I totally agree. Second major challenge most companies don't understand. The other way we use intent data, which is current customer retention. When you're talking about go-to-market strategies, most of the time marketers are talking about new logo acquisition, which is great. Everybody wants new logos. Don't get me wrong. I love top line. Give me the new logos every day, all day. But what if you as a marketer could show up to an executive meeting and show your impact to lower churn? And you said, hey, I use my intent tool to identify that Apple is going to insource their supply chain. And we got on the list to keep the Apple business as they're insourcing their supply chain. Or my best example is Aldi. Aldi showed me the list of intent signals. He had looked for Sawgrass, XPO, and Geodis. You don't know anything about those companies. I know those companies are all 3PLs. So the, the little breadcrumbs that Aldi was laying out was they're unhappy with their 3PL situation, right? Their fulfillment situation. So if you were Aldi's current fulfillment provider, which I don't know who they are, you would know, hey, we're doing something wrong. Aldi's not happy. Get back in front of them. And this is where the account management piece of the GTM motion is so important, right? So marketing and sales are going after new logo acquisition and marketing and customer success are managing retention. So I think in the order of GTM, we talk about marketing, sales, and customer success. I think it should be reversed. I think it should be sales, marketing, and customer success, and marketing touches both, right? Sales and customer success are pretty far away from each other. One's at the front end, one's at the back end. The marketing needs to sit in the middle and it needs to support both efforts, both new logo acquisition and customer churn and retention. And I think that's a growing trend. I just had a, a new client turnover, but also every company, 30 to 40% of our new revenue should be coming from expanding existing client relationships. So not only retention, but expansion. And yeah. it's like the stepchild, right? Everybody wants to go after the sexy new logo acquisition where you're overlooking 30, 40% of your newfound revenue. I so think if the marketer who sits in the middle of this GTM motion can really put her volume, velocity, and value metrics in place, and she's got new logo acquisition, volume, velocity, value, and upsell, cross-sell, retention, volume, velocity, value, this is a match made in heaven, right? Let me show you what I'm doing both for the new logos and for customer retention and cross-sell and upsell. I think so many marketers are missing it. They're just missing the opportunity entirely, right? And it's not easy because you're also responsible for the brand and the when the words and the things that are happening. Like there's it's a huge job for sure. But if you can really think about the math in those two ways, it'll set you up for success in the boardroom. I agree. I agree 100%. Right. But I have one final question for you. And that is, if there was one thing of everything we've talked about here, but one thing that you wanted everybody to take away, what would that be? I think the one thing that I want people to take away, we've talked about so much good stuff today. I think the three V's are super important. I don't want anyone to walk away thinking that they're not. But the one thing that you and I haven't talked about that I think is super important is third-party validation. We love Gartner as a partner of ours. We use Gartner all the time. I have a client, a huge company. They do all of the movement of McDonald's potatoes. And they do this for a bunch of fast food. My clients, so think McDonald's, Taco Bell, right? Big brands don't get out of bed without checking Gartner. And I think so many companies, B2B companies specifically, neglect the part, the Gartner relationship. It's annoying, but at the end of the day, 
Gartner or Forrester, Morningstar, G2 Crowd, whoever it is that's in your specific niche for us, it's Gartner all day, every day for supply chain. Really having relationship with the analysts, they're not going to tell you exactly who is in a buying cycle, right? That's really like the antithesis of what they're trying to accomplish. But this third party validation of what you do in the market and what sets you apart and what makes you different is what gets you in front of the right who. Right. So you and I, we talked about this on our prep call, have a little different perspective on content, which is totally fine. I think that the third party content is actually more important than what you say about yourself. So what you say about yourself is always self-serving. It is what it is. You can talk about pain points and follow the Donald Miller story brand process, et cetera. But what the third party says about you is even more important than what you say about yourself. So I I would just add to that the third party and your clients. Your client's voice should always precede your voice. For it's sure. your validation, right? It's sometimes it can be so hard to get your customer to talk about you, right? Like it's just really hard, especially big brands, right? Walmart is not going to talk about who they use. Like oftentimes you're under NDA, like you can't use their names at all. So the third parties talking about your product and the third parties sharing the stories of your customers. It's just Harvard has a name for it, right? Like it's outsourced credibility. Like it's this third party saying that what you're doing is real. And I think a lot of times really hard to measure. This is a really hard thing to measure. We've figured out a way to measure it, which is cool. But I think if I want someone to walk away from this podcast, oh, she's really smart. And I learned this thing. It's the three V's. All the people have written about it. I'm not the first one. But I think the one that I'd really like people to start to take seriously is how to turn an analyst relations program into revenue. Because I think it's where the intent data is going to start coming from. I I know people are going to have more questions. Would it be appropriate if we handed out the link to, say, your LinkedIn profile so people could reach out to you? Yeah, absolutely. You can find me at Kara Smith Brown. I'm really easy to find. I post to LinkedIn just about every day. Someone called me a LinkedIn influencer in supply chain, hair flip. Yeah, Uh, I post about anything supply chain related and then also just all things um, being a female in business and a business owner. I post about it all the time. So happy to connect on LinkedIn every day. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for coming on, sharing all of these insights and, and getting us to think a bit differently. That's the whole name of the game here. Thank you. Thanks for the invite.